All right. Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Julia. I am one of the administrative assistants and teachers for the Shalila Music Reach Camp this summer. Um, I graduated from UM. I was a member of the Band of the Hour, an undergrad, and also a teaching assistant with Professor McCullough for the past however many years. Um, maybe too many years, but it's okay. I liked it. Um, so today we have Professor McCullough from the University of Miami Frost Band of the Hour. He is the assistant director of athletic bands, which includes the marching band and the pet band, and as well as the director of all of percussion activities related to the marching band and athletic band. Um, before coming to Miami, he was a high school band director in Ohio for a very long time. And we are so lucky to have him here in South Florida with us. So please welcome Professor McCullough. Thank you, Julia. Um, this is great. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I was just talking to the folks who came on early, you know, a couple months ago, I think it, uh, probably two months ago, I didn't even know what Zoom is. And now I'm on a Zoom meeting, it seems several times every single day through all the craziness that we're all going through. I'm looking through the pictures and I see old friends from Ohio, all the years that I taught there. Julia was nice to not give you all the math because then people get their calculators out trying to figure out, well, just how old is that guy, you know? <laughs> Um, so she was very kind, but yeah, I taught high school and uh, some middle school and some elementary school even for a period of time, but high school all the time for 35 years in Ohio and then um, came here and, and it's funny that this is, you know, the, a program, this Music Reach program was started by Donna Shalala, who when I first came to Miami, she was the president of the University of Miami and, and literally um, made the position for me to be hired here. So it was very much, you know, Donna Shalala who brought me to the, to the campus. So this is an outstanding program um, this summer, probably more so than ever, because without some things like this, there is no way for us to communicate with you. There is no way for you to get lessons from folks on campus or hear some lectures from people on campus. So it's particularly, you know, it's a great program, but particularly pertinent to, the, to this year. Uh, I was asked to come and talk to you today a little bit about leadership and student leadership. And uh, I know we have quite an array of folks on here today. We have some people who are college students, so they're getting ready to go out and be teachers, either in music or even in some other field. We have high school students on here who either aspire to be a leader in your program, or maybe you've just recently be, been named, you're the new section leader, or you're a drum major, or you're in charge of some committee in your, your band or choir or orchestra program. Um, so we, and we have some other directors that are on here who are presently teachers, you know, and, and as any teacher, I know I'm this way, we're trying to always kind of resharpen our skills. We're trying to recreate what we do, you know, and, and tweak every single year what we're doing to see if we could do it better. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're going to talk about today. As we go through, Julia, who she mentioned this, but I really had the pleasure of having her as an undergrad. Then she went out and was really a very successful teacher here in South Florida for a few years. Then she came back and was our grad student for a couple more years with the, the, with the band. And she's our, our um, uh, in charge teaching assistant her last year, just last year. And, and uh, so it's great that she's on here with us too. She is now turn to just friend. I don't have to call her a student anymore. Now we can just be friends, but um, she's, she's spectacular. So she's gonna be watching you type in questions today. So if you have any comments or stuff, um, it's hard for us to all talk at once. And I kind of have an outline of things I wanna cover with you, but if you can make this a little more pertinent to your own situation, something comes up and goes, oh, well, he need, I wonder what, how he would handle this thing that we do or that we'd like to do or whatever, type in questions. Uh, Julia, at the end, I'm going to try to save a little time and she's going to kind of go sort through those and see what maybe the repeated question kinds of things are, some really pertinent ones that we'll, we'll try to answer those for you. And she will also be adding my email as we go through. So, and it's just real simple, dlm74 at miami.edu. And she'll put that in the comments a time or two. So if you get all done today and you're thinking about, well, you know, he was talking about how leaders do this and this, but in our program, our orchestra program or our band program, we have it structured. I wonder how he would use that or how he would design 
in those job roles. Shoot me an email anytime. So even if you don't think of the question right now or don't get to back to answering your question, I don't want you to go without an answer. So just shoot me an email and say, hey, in your session, you mentioned this, but what about that? You know, and, and then that, then we can start a dialogue and I'll be glad to get back with you. All right. So first of all, I think we need a definition of what leadership is. And I sometimes you think it's obvious, but I don't know that it, it necessarily is, okay? So think about this. Think about why is it, and you know this to be truth, so, so you, you can relate it to your school, whether you're in middle school or high school or college or whatever, or you can relate it to your life. Why is it that we naturally do what some people want us to do but we won't do what others want us to do? Why is it that we'll go way, way beyond when some teachers ask us to do stuff, but another teacher, we won't even do our homework? Why is it that I would have parents come to me when I was teaching public school all the time and I would, I would um, talk to students about the importance of starting your day and ending your day well? And we had a whole session that I would do about that. We, we won't go into great details today, but basically it meant, clean your room, make your bed, make your little part of the home perfect. So at least every time when you wake up in the morning, you start the day perfect because everything's picked up, everything that's in your place. The, I mean, the first time you, the alarm goes off, you turn your light on and everything is perfect. Then you go out and your day is as hectic and crazy as they always are. Everything goes wrong and a teacher gives you a surprise test and your parents yell at you because you were, you didn't do some project and every, you know, you know how our days go. They're always haywire. They're crazy. But then when you come back at the very end of the day, you go back to that little kind of sanctuary of your room and everything's in its place and everything's picked up and whatever. Okay. So there's a, real, there's a real thought about that, which we won't go into great detail. But if you can start and end every day perfectly, makes all the other something you can, you can handle. So I would say that we'd have a whole session on that. And then every kid would go home and clean the room. And I'd get all, all these parents going, how in the world do you get people to, I mean, the kid's been living in the house for 16 years. and They've never cleaned their room once. How did you just say that for an hour? And they all went home. Well, I don't know the, how that happens, but that's human nature. Sometimes you will do what people want. There's something about them and sometimes you won't. Another interesting thing is not all leaders lead us where we want to go. There, are, there is such a thing as people who are very magnetic. They, they can get people to do what they want them to do, but they don't necessarily lead you where you wish you were being led. And you, you can look through your programs at school, you can look through your sports teams, you can look at the government, you can look anywhere you want. And sometimes people that are really effective getting people to follow them, probably, you know, if we had control, we probably wish people didn't follow them. So what is it? Well, how can that ha happen? You know, why is that? Um, there was um, a gentleman that I really admire by the name of Tim Lotzenheiser, and, and Tim does motivational speaking, he's been doing it for a really long time. I was right out of college when I first saw him and met him. And he talks about every group that you ever are in or ever will be in breaks down like this. There are 10% leaders. And those are the kids who are in your orchestra, in your choir, in your band, in your math class, in, in your, on your sports team, whatever. And those 10% those of 10% is relatively small. Those 10% will do anything that they're asked to do by whoever's in charge of that group, the director or the coach or, or the teacher or whatever. Those 10%, I mean, they're almost unstoppable, almost disgustingly. Those, those people are the ones that are over there and sorting the stuff and cleaning and they'll take the trash out on their way out of the room. They're just, they're, they're those kids. Every band, every orchestra, every team has that 10%. Then you have at the other end of the spectrum about 10%. And, and his little term is he used to call those kids zip heads and I've borrowed that term from him. And those are the ones that have a huge influence over other students, but they're always going the wrong way. They're the ones when someone tells you in your group, you gotta memorize your music, they never memorize their music. You gotta be on time, they're never on time. You gotta do this, they never do that. But they have some kind of magnetic ability to get people to want to be like them. They have a trainee program. And then you have 80% in the middle of the group, and they will just follow whoever seems to be the strongest polar opposite end. If the 10% of leaders 
who I bet most of you aspire to be, if you can control the 80%, then 90% of the group does what you want it to do. And that last 10%, they kind of feel helpless and they'll all just kind of go, okay, and they'll just go with it. But if that top 10%, the designated leaders aren't the strongest 10 and the bottom 10% is, then that middle 80%, those are the groups you've been in and go, this group is just out of control. It doesn't seem to ever get their act together. We, get, we, we take one step forward, 10 steps back, and we never get it. Ah, then who is really leading that group? Which end? So we want to think about that. You know, being an effective leader or being a good leader aren't necessarily one in the, uh, one in the same thing. Okay, so why do, we, why do we let people lead us? We trust them maybe we believe them what they say and you know what they tell us is believable probably there's part of that we just like them there's they're they're charismatic there's something about them that they're likable i think that plays into it they have a title they're the section leader they're the captain they're the drum major they're the whatever titles we give people you know so we just do it because they have a title i think that's one of the weakest reasons I think it's a part of a reason, but I think it's one of the weakest reasons. Just because you have a title, that doesn't mean you've proven anything that someone else has given you the title. And that also kind of would say, then if I don't have a title, I can't lead. And I think that's absolutely not true. I think some of the strongest leaders in any group you're ever in are people who don't have titles. It's what they choose to do, okay? But always keep in mind that being a good leader and an effective leader aren't, aren't all the same thing. So then I would ask if we were in a classroom, which I, I wish we were, I wish we were all, you know, hanging out in a, in a band room somewhere. I feel more comfortable there than, than I ever will on a Zoom thing. But if we were sitting in a room, I would ask you to either on a sheet of paper or I'd pick on somebody and make you come up to the board and everybody put their hand up and you would tell me what you think leadership is. And it's, it's, it's funny, we would say a bunch of all the same things. Like if we asked you to re write them down on your paper first, you would say leaders are people who are in charge or leaders are people who tell other people what to do or people, uh, some of you might say leaders are based on seniority, like seniors would be up here. If you're in a high school setting, seniors are up here, but that's, you know, juniors can't be that because juniors are here and freshmen, well, they're not even on, you know. So you would have all this seniority based stuff, which I don't believe in at all. I think that's just bunk. I just think that was made up by a senior class many years ago and we keep buying into it because getting older, doesn't necessarily mean you get smarter or that you're better at things. And you all know that. That's why sometimes you think you're smarter than your parents. You never just go, oh, well, sorry, mom, you're older than me, you're right. No, you don't think that. But yet then you turn right around and you want to have freshmen think you're smarter because you've been in high school for three years and they're only their first year, you know. So, um, so it's funny how we, we use that age thing when we want to, but we don't use it all the time. Uh, I remember being on or listening to a session one time. I wasn't even teaching the session, but I was just listening and a, a kid very honestly, they were going around like, what do you think leadership is? What do you think? And they just blurted out. They go, um, I think there's three parts to it. I think it's power, it's manipulation and it's control. You know, and that's when like every siren in the room has to go off like, whoop, whoop, whoop. You must not, you must never be a leader if you think that because those, none of those, it's not about control. You're not there to manipulate people. You know, it's not about being powerful, but I also know where that comes from. And so do you, because some leaders manipulate people and some leaders are all about trying to prove that they're powerful and some leaders aren't leading, they're trying to control you. They're leading from behind because they're hitting you with a sharp object to make you move. So I understand where that comes from, but it's, it comes from a dark, bad place. You know, that's not something we should, we should try, to, try to continue or try to um, repeat. So here are some definitions, okay? Here are some definitions. And then I, the last definition, I'm gonna give you three examples. They're all good, they're all good. They're from people far smarter than myself. And then I'll give you the one that, that we like to use here at the university now and the one that I've been using for years and years and years before I ever came, came here to South Florida. First one is, this is kind of, I've got this in quotes, getting people to do what you want them to do by making them think it's what they want to do. Now think about that for a second. Getting people to do what you want them to do 
but by making them think it's what they want to do. So there's in there, the word that I always think of is salesmanship. You're selling them on the idea of doing this and this and this so that they actually think they thought of it instead of, again, just saying, oh, here's what we got to do. Whether you like it or not, this is what we got to do. No, it's selling the concept of what needs done and getting everyone who you want them to do it, getting them all to think like they dreamt it up, making them think it's what they want to do. Boom, I, I could care less who takes credit for it. I just care that it gets done, right? The, the getting the thing accomplished is far more important than me saying, and this was my idea. I don't care whose idea it was, let's just get it done. So that one comes from President uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. That was, his, that was his definition of leadership, is getting people to do things that he wanted them to do by making them think that it's what they wanted. Another one is leadership is the ability to get people to do what you want, but um, don't, I'm sorry, let me read this correctly so we, I don't misquote him. Leadership is the ability to get people to do what they don't want to do by making them think it is what they want to do. So it's really similar but it's, but you're going to have to sell, it's going to take a better salesman. Okay. It's going to, you're going to have to be a better salesman. And that was from another president. That was from, from Harry Truman. That they really are, you're going to have to get people to do things that they don't want to do, but you're going to have to make them think they do and like it. So not like, okay, I had to do it. So I did. Well, no, and then they have a bad taste in their mouth. Even after it's completed, they don't even enjoy the fact that they completed it because it wasn't enjoyable. So he added that extra little thing in there and like it. So I think you've got to sell it better. You have to make it enjoyable as, as you go through this. And, and it's probably something that involves work. Everything worth doing has work involved. You know, there is sweat and time and effort and toil. And I mean, everything worth doing is probably hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it. So, so his went one step further and make sure that they like it. And then the third example, before we get to my kind of simplified one, comes in three parts, that leadership has three parts. And leadership is, first of all, and you have to develop them kind of in stages. The first part is you have to do a yes, we can attitude. You have to develop a culture, and I'm gonna use that word several times. You have to develop a culture. That's the way we feel in this organization. You have to develop that. You have to develop a yes, we can. So you develop a culture where people start to really think they could do anything they set their mind to. That's different because a lot of people go, ah, we're, you know, we'll, we'll never play this piece of music because it's just too hard. We tried to play a piece like this two years ago and it sucked. And the judges told us, ah, you, you shouldn't have tried that. So then they never want to try again. Or, oh, we can't, we can't do, we go to those contests and we, we never do well. Oh, well, I, you know, I can never audition for that because I've never, I auditioned my freshman year and I didn't make it. So there's no sense of me ever trying out for an honor band again. I, I tried once and I didn't get it. So, so we, we talk ourselves out of it. So you got to break that apart. You got to blow that up and you have to kind of develop a yes, we can attitude. Then the second part is you have to be inclusive. You have to get everybody on board. You can't just go to the seniors in the band and go, okay, we're going to make this happen because we're seniors. And if we don't make it happen, we're going to mess up our senior year. Well, what about the juniors and sophomores and freshmen? You can't just, you know, if it's a middle school program, you can't just go, okay, we're eighth graders, so we're going to make it great because that's our last year. Of course, we're not even going to include the sixth grade because they're, they're so little, they don't even know what they're doing. No, you have to be inclusive because you're never truly going to be great until everyone's on board with it. So you have to be inclusive. You've got to use everybody. And the third part is you have to be incredibly clear. And boy, I see this one missed a lot. This is where people strike out a lot on this one. You have to be really clear about your vision of what it is we're trying to do. If it's a little blurry, even if it's appealing, but it's not really focused, then this this person tries to do it this way and this person kind of does it just slightly different and here's a person who goes oh i thought you meant now we've got all that we're not all pushing on the same thing in the same way because we weren't clear with our objective but if we could get that if we can get the attitude the culture of the group to be yeah we could do anything we set our mind to we've proven that time and time again so you get that yes we can mindset and you're inclusive you get everybody feeling like they're contributing youngest person, oldest person, guy, girl, everybody, everybody's pushing on the same spot. Okay. 
and you're really clear of what it is we're trying to achieve. So no one's kind of going off and zinging off left or right, trying their own version. Okay, you're, that's leadership. If you can focus those three parts, then, okay, someone's being a leader to make all that happen. And that came from another president, that's President Barack Obama, thought that it took three parts. So that, that came from him. All right, those are all great. I could quote other you know, famous people, some of you'd heard of. We could quote some mus musicians. <clears throat> There's all kinds of famous ways to think about leadership. Here's what I think it is. And I, you know, remember, you know, students very often say it's the person in charge. It's getting to tell people what to do. It's power. It's no, here's what I think it is. I think it's, and this one has served every single time. I've never, ever come up with a situation where I found someone being a great leader. This, this isn't what they were doing. All right. So this, this is not just a thought of mine. This is kind of tried and true. Like, wow, they're really good at leading this. Oh, look, that's why. So I've really spent a lot of time. I'm old, as Julia was pointing out, so I've had lots of time to think about this. But I've really watched people who are great at what they do about getting something to move the direction they want it to move. And here's the one that's always true. Leadership is service. That was simple, simpler than any of the presidents. It's service. It's servicing the people around you. It's making everybody else's experience better because you are there. You're a leader. It's, it's really that simple. Leadership is service. Now, it's funny because some people get into leadership because it's a thing. It's a position. You know, there are bands that, you know, in the old days when I was in high school band, if you were the leader, you got a jacket. And if you weren't a leader, you didn't get that stripe. Or you got to wear shoulder cords on the other shoulder if you were a leader for a second year. And, you know, so it was, a, it was a shiny object. So you wanted it because when we see a shiny object, we all want it. That's why they put all that goofy stuff right at the checkout counter of Target. Because they know you don't need any of it. But if you see it there, you go, oh, I got to have all that stuff. And then you get it home and go, why in the world did I buy all this stuff? I don't need this stuff. But there, it's the shiny object. So it's something you think you want temporarily. So some people get into leadership for that. I'm in the trombone section. And there's a guy called or a girl called the trombone section leader. That ought to be me. I play trombone. There's a person that we call the band captain. I'm in the band. I should be the band captain. We just want it because it's there. A lot of people get into the idea of leadership for that reason. I'm not even so sure. I was a section leader in my high school my sophomore year. I'm not so sure I didn't want to be section leader just because my freshman year I found out there was a thing called the section leader. I might have done it too. It was there. I'm going to be in the section. Why shouldn't I be the leader? So I really pushed myself to try to be. Now, here's where not so successful leaders stop. They got it. They wanted it first. They wanted it. They got it. They're done. But great leaders saw it. They wanted it. They got it. And as soon as they get it, they realize, oh, you know what? This really isn't about the position. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to make other people's experiences better. They change their mindset once they get it. I'm okay with that. If you just got the position because you wanted it and you were good enough that you got it, okay, so maybe that's not, you know, you didn't like charge in the door because I'm here to help people. Well, okay, that's all right, got you in the door. But now if you've been named a leader and you're in the door, Oh, now you need to reevaluate. This is where you got to get the mirror in front of you and look yourself in the, you know, look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, you know what? This isn't about me at all. This is about everybody else, you know, depending on what, you know, you're in charge of equipment now. Oh, so I'm supposed to help everybody by making sure that having the right equipment at the right place at the right time loaded the right way, et cetera. It's never a problem. Yep. That's your job. Okay. And on and on and on. So, you know, just because you thought it was, well, I wanted to be that because it's a big deal in our program to be, you know, the first chair violin. Well, that's great. It is a big deal. But as soon as you get that, you should realize, oh, you know, what I really need to do now is get all the other violins to play better. My real job is to help every other violinist, not just sit there and have people, you know, think that I'm cool because I get to sit in the first chair. So that's a, that's a thought. All right. Let's go through some um, 
there's another there's another word we we called today's session we called it um, leadership but there's another term that very often confuses they crisscross a little bit with with that and it's called being a manager and I want you to really understand the difference because sometimes people think they are leading and they're really only a manager and I'm not saying like okay well my mom's a store manager well that's that's great that store needs a manager. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the word. Actually, what I'm saying is there's two different, it's two different jobs. There's leading and there's managing. And I think great leaders do both. But I have also seen people with the title of leader, and to be honest, they should have been given the title of manager. That's a valuable position and it's things that need to be done, but it's, they're not the same. So let me give you some examples. Okay, the difference of leading people versus just managing work or projects. I get the work done, I manage the projects, my choir director says pass out all the music, I pass out all the music. Okay, that's really a manager. You're just doing busy work that the, the leader needed you to do. Now, if I pass out all the music, and as I'm passing out the music, I have organized it in a way that makes it easier for everybody to, to take care of because I put it all in folders and I have it all alphabetic, uh, alphabetical order and I make sure there's a pencil in everybody's folder and I make sure that we have a storage box to keep it in. All right, now I'm starting to leave and I put little instructions on the other page about how to take care of music and how our director likes to mark things in the music, but he, he or she only likes us to mark it in pen. Ah, see, I didn't just pass the stuff out. That's a manager. I'm being a leader because I've come up with a new way of doing it, a better way of doing it, and I've even started to forecast the mistakes that people might make. They're marking on the permanent music with you know crayons because I've seen idiots do that before. So I've already kind of you know thought out solutions before the problem could ever even you know rear its ugly. Right now I'm being a leader. Another one is the leader shows vision and. The manager just creates obstacles and they try to be efficient. See, I need to be really efficient. I think you need to be incredibly organized. I need, think you need to be really you know, systematic in what you want your people to do if you're the leader. But at the same time, you need to be kind of the visionary and getting those people to be excited about the possibility of taking this further than any of them ever thought it could go. Not job done but seeing how we can raise the bar of the job as we're getting the job done. Does that make sense? How can we get better and better and better, you know, always getting it done, but we're never hitting the target because we, we, on purpose, we keep moving the target. We keep raising the expectations. We never go, well, he said to do this, so we did that, now we must be great. Well, then it means we're done. If we're ever satisfied, that means all learning, all achievements, all satisfaction, all enjoyment is done. We've peaked. And I would, I would hate that. I would certainly not be, you know, I'm going on my, I don't even know. I've lost track of how many years I've been doing this, you know, over like 45. I sure wouldn't be still teaching this if I had peaked. My first year of teaching was really fun. It was really successful. I would have quit way back then. So the only way for me to continue to do this and the only reason for you to continue to do it, and you've got years and years and years in front of you because you're all young, is you got to keep raising the bar. You know, why would you just jump over this little hurdle and go, eh, I'm done. I can't, I can't imagine doing that. I can't imagine what would get me out of bed in the morning if I thought I'd already achieved everything there was worth achieving, okay? A leader has long-term impact. Managers have short-term impact, okay? I've, I've seen so many people go, well, I did this, I was the section leader, and then I left, and like, you know, kind of everything fell apart. That's a shame. Then you didn't have long-term impact. You got the job done, but then when you left, the job, it was like, it was like you had never been there, okay? The idea is that you do such a, a change of culture as the leader that when you leave, the thing just keeps going on its own. You really create, you got the thing maybe in motion, but it certainly shouldn't fall apart like a house of cards because you walk away. Um, a leader appeals to the heart and a manager more appeals to the head. This is where we think, this is how we logically figure out how to do things. That's, that's important. Let's be smart about this. Let's not rehearse stupidly. Let's rehearse. Let's go through our day as intelligently as we can. 
but that doesn't include your heart. Since you can't be as smart as you're capable of being if it isn't emotionally a part of you. Okay, it's got you have to have some kind of emotional contact or connection with it. So I think you've got to appeal to the head and the heart. Um, a leader gets their power, their, 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 their systematic way of doing things from having charisma, okay? Um, a manager more because they have a position of authority. My band director, my choir director, my orchestra director, my math teacher put me in charge of passing out books because she said I'm in charge of the books. Okay, well, that's, that's going to wear off. And in fact, some people will try to not let you pass the books out correctly because they don't like people in authority. But if you can appeal to them because they like you, you make yourself likable, you make a game out of what you do, you're, it's, it's, it's fun, yet efficient, yet smart, you know, you'll get much, you'll get much further. Uh, a leader seeks opportunities and a manager very often controls risks. I don't think we better try that because it might not work. So let's just do this. It's safer. And this person knows, you know, if we don't stick our neck out a little bit and try to play that extra hard piece of music, or we don't try to, you know, push ourselves a little bit and have everything memorized by this weekend, or if we don't, we'll never get to where we fully can be. We'll never raise the bar as high as it can go. Um, leaders tend to be proactive. They think ahead. Oh, you know what? We do that thing on Friday and people are going to forget this and this and this. So I'm going to send out a reminder on Thursday so that nobody forgets that. You know, we have to have our hat and we have to have our mask and we have to have our hand sanitizer and we have to have it Friday and we haven't seen him since Monday. So everyone's going to forget. So on Thursday night, I'm going to send a reminder to everybody. And then a manager maybe just shows up on Friday and goes, well, we're doing push-ups because you guys didn't remember your stuff. They're reactive instead of proactive. There's a big difference. Okay. And a leader influences and motivates people, influences and motivates influences and motivates and a manager kind of directs and controls there are times you have to direct you have to say guys here's what here's what we need to do and there are times when you need to motivate and say hey guys make sure you keep your eyes open and if you see, see things that need to be done let's get it done and let somebody go oh should we throw the trash away sure guys well let's do that we should let them come up with the idea of what needs to be done okay and you can steer them a little you know, remember one of the one of the definitions, getting other people to do what you want them to do by making them think it's what they want to do, but building the culture that creates everyone looking for those jobs. They're all they're kind of all in search of those jobs. All right. Now, let me ask you some questions. And these are kind of, you know, again, in this setting, you have to kind of think through these. OK, could you be a great leader? All right. Do you and are you willing to send messages to your people. Can you talk to people and always talk in terms of what we want versus what I want? Okay. Here's what we need to do. We need to do this. We need to do that. And before our sectional is over, I want to make sure we can, we can do this and this and this. And everybody goes, okay, All right. That is what we want. Or, okay, guys, today, I need you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want, because as soon as you say, I want, okay, I'll tell you, from personal experience, I'm a drummer. You know, there's like the rest of the group of the instrumentalists, and then there's the drummers. We're like over here, like we see everything a little, you know, different. So if someone stands in front of me and go, okay, I want you to do this, and I want, I would be standing there with the heavy drum on in like a marching band, and I'd be going, I'm really glad that you want that, because I don't want that. And you gave me that choice. You said, I want you to, and I'm going mentally, that's nice. I don't. But if someone says, all right, we need to do this and we want to do that. And okay, sure we do. I do too. So I would, I would tend to agree with that. So you got to be really careful that you always talk in terms of we, us, not me, I. So be really cautious of that. So if you want to be a great leader, are you able to do that? Or will you most of the time be thinking about what you want, okay? Can you deal with your peers and your friends looking at you slightly differently now because you're in a leadership position? You and your best friend are in the clarinet section. You become the clarinet section leader. Your best friend was 
trying for the clarinet section leader, they didn't get chosen. Can you now deal with the fact that your best friend, maybe since who knows when, elementary school suddenly sees you differently because you are asking them to do things that you want done for the group and actually they wanted to be the person that got to ask. That's a real thing. That's a real dynamic. That's, you know, that, that never goes away. If someone you're, you know, someday you'll work for a living and you'll work in a company and someone you've been working side by side forever gets promoted and you don't. That's a weird dynamic. So you gotta, you gotta be ready for that. You can't just go, well, I'll deal with it when it comes. And you gotta think about that. How well do you communicate with people? Your communication skills are everything when it comes to being an effective leader. I, I can't, uh, we could just do a whole session on that alone. You've gotta be able to talk to people. More importantly, probably, you gotta be able to listen to people. You have to be very professional. If people are, you know, texting you things, you can't go, I don't feel like dealing with text tonight. My section can just deal with it. No, they're reaching out to you. And you, they're only gonna reach out to you a time or two, and then if they don't get answers, they're gonna reach out to somebody else. And I've had section leaders come to me, why does everybody go to Susan? Susan's not the section leader, but keep asking Susan what to do. Well, because Susan knows what to do and you never get back with them. So of course, if I were in your section, I would go to Susan too. Because if I go to Susan, I can get an answer. If I go to you, I can't find you half the time. So you gotta be careful. You gotta be really available and really good at communicating. Okay, how well do you follow up on things? So if you start something, do you keep following up? If you give people something to do, do you follow up and make sure they're being successful at it or giving them help if they need help? Or how do you just like say, oh, there it is. Hope you do it, because if not, I guess we're not. Well, no, you gotta follow up on it. Are you a builder of things? Do you like building things? Do you like going very systematically? Let's get this done, let's get that done, let's get this, we can add this as soon as this is completed. Those people tend to be good leaders, okay? Are you, do you have a track record of making things better? Do, do, do things around you tend to get better all the time? Or do you just kind of let it be the status quo, okay? Um, can you live up to the standards that you're gonna expect other people to have, okay? That's a, that's a tricky one, okay? Especially if you start sending those I words. Okay, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And I want you to have your music all memorized. And I want you to always have a pencil at rehearsal and I want you to have your drill book and I want you to have this and I want you to, and then you come and you kind of don't have your water bottle or your drill book or you kind of misplaced page two of the opener. And how in the world, how in the world can you ever expect other people to do something that you're not really consistent and being good at yourself? Okay. Are you a, this is a big one. We could do a whole session on this. In fact, I am later in the, in the fall for a group. Are you a make things happen person? Are you a watch things happen person? Or are you the person that's just always wondering, wandering around going, what's happening? I don't know what's happening. I mean, think about that. Because you know people of all three kinds. You know people right now that you could put faces and names. Man, that person makes things happen. They, I mean, literally, they walk in the room and boom, things change for the good. Wow, that person would sit right there and watch me carry heavy boxes and never once help me pick up this stupid box. They will just sit there and watch me do it. And you know, you know people just like that. And you know people that are in your organization, no matter what band, choir, orchestra, team, you know, whatever, they never know what's going on. You go, hey, do you need a ride to the, con you know, we got contest Friday. You do need a ride? Oh, contest is Friday? I mean, uh, this Friday? Are you sure? You know, they don't even know what's going on. And you know, again, all of your different organizations you come from, you could put specific names and faces with all those kinds of people. Well, you need to be the kind of person, if you want to be a leader, that makes things happen. Can't sit and watch other people do it, and you certainly can't be the person who doesn't know, you know, what's, what's going on. Can you stay motivated and consistent for an entire year? Can you, you know, do you get all excited at the beginning of the year and all excited at like a band camp or something? You get all excited when we start the new show or the new music or the new stuff for, you know, concert band contest or, oh, I got this new jazz chart. I love it. And then you kind of die out because it just gets repetitious and, you know, you get, you get tired of doing it. Okay. Can't be that person. You, you can't be that person in life. There's, there's repetition in life. A lot of life is doing the same thing over and over. And if you don't make it exciting to do it over and over, boy, are you going to have a lot of days in your life that are disappointing. 
because a lot of days are like a lot of other days. You're going to have to make them interesting for yourself. No one can, no one can do that for you. How are your listening skills? If you can't listen to people, then you're going to have a terrible time ever being helpful to people. You're, you're not going to be able to service people. And I think leadership is service. You're not going to be able to service people if you can't listen to what's going on around you, okay, and listen to other folks. Will you be able to support the decisions of the people above you, whether you agree with them or not? So your director thinks this, or your director says, hey, by the way, we've changed the schedule, and we're going to have to drop this, we're going to have to do that instead. Can you, can you support that decision, even if you don't think that's a great decision? That's really hard to do sometimes. And yet your peers are going to come to you and go, did you see what Mrs. So-and-so said? Or did you see what Mr. So-and-so said? I think that's the dumbest decision ever. And you are a leader in his or her organization. You have to support what the decision from above was. And sometimes that's hard. That's really difficult. Okay. But you have to. You can't put yourself in, yeah, you're right. That was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Because now they've got you. They've got you. They know that you don't 100% approve of the thing that you were asked to do. You can't, you can't ever fall into that trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. Can't fall into that. Um, will you have more desire to do things right than other people in your organization will have to do them wrong? Can you stay motivated and consistent when it'll seem like, I don't care what, I, I've been connected with some of the greatest band organizations probably in the country. I mean, top top notch and yet on a very regular basis i'll look over and see something and go are you kidding me they did what and i've been with great bands and i see that if you're with an organization that's not the greatest you're seeing that i mean you you everywhere you look maybe and yet you can't let down and go all right they win they they want to do it wrong more than i want to do it right just let them do it wrong no you can't you can't give in you can't give in so you got to be, you know, or do you have that relentless part of your personality to just, I'm going to fight the good fight forever. You got to, you got to have that. Um, can you put everybody else's needs before your own personal needs? And that's, that's a really, that's a hard one to do. And yet so important. This kid, you're, you're, will will say you're a band kid. This kid needs help with his or her music. This kid doesn't understand this handbook requirement. This kid goes, we're supposed to fill these forms out and I'm a freshman. I don't know how to fill this form out. Can you help me? Now, the whole time, everyone and their brother seems to be asking you for help. You have a big project due for an English class. You're swamped because of your English teacher who forgot that there's band in the world and he or she dumped this huge thing on you yesterday and it's due tomorrow. And yet this kid wants help with his part and this kid needs help with this. And you've got a parent came up to you on the way. You were just trying to get to your car to go home. And the parent goes, hey, you know, my daughter is a freshman in your section. And can you help her? Could you text her tonight or Zoom with her? Because she's having trouble with her clarinet part. And you're going, oh, my God, my, my English part. You want to be the leader, you have to be there for them. You have to figure out how to manage time and to use every second efficiently because they need you and you signed on to service their needs because leadership is service. You need to try to help every one of them and never let yourself, never use it as an excuse to let yourself fall behind. You're not allowed to fail, but you're not allowed to fail them either. Sorry. Um, do you have a track record that will help you or hurt you? If I, if I could, again, if we were in the room here and we could all talk and introduce ourselves and we could all say what school we're from and, you know, all that. And we've got schools, of, you know, different states and stuff represented here. But then if I went back and talked to the teachers or your, your uh, peers, your fellow band or choir or orchestra students at your school and said, hey, tell me about that kid. What are they like? Do you have a track record that would automatically make people think that you are capable and ready to be a leader? Ah, it's a tough one, isn't it? So you mean they're gonna pull up that incident like last year? Yes, because they can't forget it, you know? Were you the kid who got all the way to, you know, some big event and didn't have their music or didn't have their instrument or said, I really screwed up, I didn't bring a mouthpiece and, you know, I know I have solo, but I'm really, 
but now you are the person in charge. How are they supposed to forget that? You know, I'd feel really nervous if you were in charge because you couldn't even help yourself be organized, let alone try to now help everybody else. Think about that, okay? A um, couple other things real quick, and then I wanna get to, uh, I bet Julia has been watching some questions here. Think about this statement. And, and remember, I can send you any of this stuff because you know you can't sit there and, and jot notes. I wouldn't even want you to attempt to do that. But think about uh, if you want any of this stuff in writing, you can always send me an email. And Julia has been putting in the in the uh, comments in the text there, the, you know, my email address. So please reach out if you want to build. This is like a little thought. If you want to build a great organization, whatever that might be, band, choir, orchestra, a team you're on, it doesn't matter, that you could fill in the blank. If you want to build a great organization, you must first establish a culture of being great. We, if we're going to build a, a band out of all of you on the Zoom today, we have to agree in detail that we are absolutely committed to being great. Have to. We can't have go, well, yeah, if you guys are great, I'll, I'll come along. You know, I, I, I wouldn't mind being in it. I just don't want to help make it. No, we, all of us, have to agree that we want to be in a culture where things are always aiming at being great. To do that, we've got to set really high standards. We can't just go, well, let's just put the bar here because we're pretty sure we'll get that. No, we can't dumb it down. We have to put the bar sky high. And yet, if we build the culture right, then we're going to reach for that, that bar that is sky high. Okay? To do that, set high standards for yourself and all the people around you, your colleagues, in every aspect of the operation. And people fall short of that. Well, we don't really rehearse well. Our attendance is really bad. <coughs> Kids don't practice. But, God, I hope we get straight this Saturday. Well, no, wait, it depends. We have bad attendance, we don't rehearse well, we don't do this, we don't do that, but we hope we're gonna do, well, no. That, that, that'd be silly, you know, that's silly. So you have to set high standards for yourself, you have to set high standards for the people around you in every aspect of the operation, the what you're, whatever it is you're doing, and you have to make everybody accountable. You have to make everybody accountable. People have to like, you know, okay, we expect you to do this, and then we expect you to do this. There has to be consequences if, if you don't do this, okay? And then out of those high standards will come greatness. That's, that's how you do it. Talent, I hear people talk about talent sometimes. Talent does determine a little bit of life. Well, that kid is just naturally talented. He can hit high notes on the trumpet that you know a lot of kids can't hit. Wow, he's got really fast hands on the snare drum. He's talented. Okay, that's... That's that much toward, it's good. I mean, it's great. I'd rather, have, I'd rather have you have talent than no talent, but it only accounts for that much, okay? Motivation determines what you're willing to do. How motivated are you? That's much bigger. Talent, it goes on the scale. Motivation, it's a chunk. And attitude determines how well you will do it. Attitude, I can't even show you on the screen. Attitude is huge. Motivation is very large. Talent's right here. It's nice. It's spice. Okay? It's the spice. Some people forget that. Well, I'm talented. And they don't think they have to be motivated or work hard or have a good attitude. In fact, some of the most talented people I've ever been around have a terrible attitude because they think they're going to completely go on talent. That never works. That never works. And I've had people walk in and go, all right, I'm not a great player, but I practice a whole bunch and I do this and I do that. And, I, you know, and I go, we, we'll take you. We're, we're good. And I've had those people knock it out of the park, them grow in ways they never even thought they could grow, you know. And I've seen that in, I've seen that in little kids. I used to teach middle school. I saw middle school kids do that all the time, you know, who said, I, you know, I, I'm trying really hard and, and I just kept keep trying. We're gonna keep trying. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna let, here's a trick or here's a trick. All of a sudden, by the time they got to high school, they were great. I've had freshmen come into high school that thought there's no way. I don't even think I'll survive. I don't even think I'll survive band camp, let alone my freshman year, let alone four years. And they graduated being the drum major of the band. I had a young man come to the University of Miami in a college marching band who had never played the drum. 
played cymbals for a year, super successful. Played bass drum for a year, super successful. Played tenors for a year, incredibly successful. I gave him the option of his fourth year moving to snare drum because he was ready. And he goes, no, nah, I think I'll stay on tenors. And I go, okay, great, we're gonna make you co-section lead. He walked into the University of Miami and he had never played the drums. Okay, don't, you know, don't even get me started on his motivation or his attitude. And he walked in with kind of, I don't even know if I can show it, like that much talent on drums. But he's a real smart kid, worked really hard, and he was like a big old teddy bear you just wanted to hug all the time. Super successful. Okay. All right, Julie, I bet you got some questions. You got anything? Yes, we do. We okay. have a question here. Um, well, it's a two-part question with two right. parts. When trying to decide what to do to help the group you're in, what should you look for? Should you ask the people in the group what they want to do to get better? I would, uh, yeah, you should always, you sh yes. It's never wrong to ask questions and it's never wrong to communicate. It's never wrong to get opinions and it's that, I mean, how would that be wrong, right? I think that's always true. However, I don't think that's enough. I think uh, your questions are probably coming from, you know, I'm gonna guess Julia a little bit, but this is probably coming from a high school student. All right, mm -hmm. so I used to have to have this discussion all the time. If a high school student, we're gonna kind of average you together. A high school student is 15 years old. A couple are a little younger, a couple are a little older, but you know, the average in your section might be 15. All right, so if you had, even in a big band, and I used to have the, uh, the luxury of having a little itty bitty band, and then for many years, I had a great big, huge band. So you might have a section of a zillion people in your section. You know, sometimes we had, goodness, 30 some kids that all played the same instrument or something but the average age is 15. But if you get 30 of them together, that's not 30 times 15 experience. It's just 15. So I don't think you can always, and this is certainly not a put down to young people, because if I didn't love young people, boy, I wouldn't be doing the job I'm still doing. I love being around young people and their energy and their thoughts and their questions and their comments. And it's, it's, un, it's contagious, it's great. But I think then you get their opinion, you get their thoughts, and then you look elsewhere. And where you look is, well, what do really successful groups do? What do groups do that are more successful than ours? If it's a jazz band, what, what do the, how do the top jazz bands deal with that? How do the top marching bands deal with it? What do they, you know, those orchestras that we see when we go to a state contest or, or a national, how do they do things? And reach out and find out reach out, you know, like I used to contact other instructors. So how do you do that? Other directors, how did you do that? I saw you guys pl play on stage and I saw you play the Shostakovich. How did you get the woodwinds to be that in tune? I've never, I've never been able to get my woodwinds that in tune. And they go, oh, well, we do this. And we, you know, we did this trick thing with tuners and we bought this method corral book. And so look elsewhere. Don't just look from within, because if we only look from within, we only see that kind of weird reflection of ourselves. So look outside too. So yes, get their opinion, but blow that open. Think, think bigger than that. Open up that box a little bit. Julia, what else you got? Um, how have you overcome the challenges of leading in your own life? Um, I, think, I think it's that I've always, felt like I had more to learn. I think that's the biggest, I think that that's the biggest. I think that um, I am, I, by nature, I'm organized. I'm very, I'm a very organized person or try to be, and that has served me well. I am very self-motivated. I'm, I'm pretty competitive. I don't like to lose. That's part of my nature. Um, and yet I can focus that and I can influence other people into seeing what they possibly might be able to reach for. My favorite part, I think this, I think maybe the best way to answer this for you, whoever asked the question, is the question I get a lot here because I teach music education courses and I teach percussion methods and I teach a, um, a, a leadership class that we offer at the University of Miami. We do, we do a music ed leadership class and, and I teach a marching band techniques class and I get asked a lot, well, Mr. McCullough, if you're on year 40, blah, blah, whatever, what makes you still enjoy this? 
because they're wondering, could they ever enjoy this for, could they teach high school for 35 years and, and like it that long? Teachers don't make it that long in the profession anymore. It's rare that people do it that long. And I, my answer is, is pretty clear in my mind. I love the moment of watching, it's like the old cartoons. I have a misspent youth, youth when I watched a lot of cartoons as a kid. And in cartoons, when the little character, whoever it is, you know, Wile E. Coyote or something, when he gets an idea, the little bulb comes on over his head. I've all seen those cartoons. You know, that means he's thought of something. You know, like he's figured it out. The light bulb comes on. And I have seen that light bulb come on over top of literally thousands of students. And I saw it come on. My last band thing was with a, right before we all went, you know, we all shut down here for uh, the COVID. We were on a band trip with a pep band up in North Carolina for the ACC basketball championships. And I asked a kid on that trip to play a solo on one of the tunes that, that she doesn't always play the solo on that tune. And I don't think she'd ever played the solo on that tune. And she played it and she nailed it. And literally, that's my last thing I taught right before we flew home and the world had come to an end. I saw that little girl, I saw the light bulb gone over her head because she figured out how to do it. And she surprised herself and could do something she didn't think she could do. And I loved that as much as my first year of teaching back in Dayton, Ohio. When a kid can do something they never could do, oh my God, that feels good. And you feel like you helped them do that. You feel like you were just a, you know, oh my God. It does, I, it's my favorite thing. It will be my favorite thing until I don't do this anymore. It's, it's my favorite thing. All right, Julia, what else you got? Anything? Yeah, I got a couple more. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think you'll like this one. As someone that enjoys goofing off, how do you communicate and instill discipline to yourself and to others to keep rehearsals or meetings structured and productive? <laughs> um, well, let's see. Okay, I, I'll go back to I'm a drummer, so don't think that I'm serious all, all the time or that being this, okay, it's, you know, it's, oh, come on, I'm a drummer, I can't help myself. But I'm even a jazz drummer, so that's worse. There, You know, there's drummers and then there's jazz drummers. <laughs> They're like way over there. So, um, so I get it. But here is the, here is the, here is how, what keeps you on course. You know, it's like those little cars you drive at like Disney, but it's got the rails so you can't go too far off the track, you know, so they can let kids who can't drive, drive. This gets you back on track because you've got to do what's best for everyone. And I know that I can get off the rails. I can, but I won't. Not in front of people. There's a time for everything. You know, for one time, you know, one time, literally, we were one of the biggest marching band shows, and I, we used to take our high school band to incredibly big events, and and they were great, and, and it was so fun, and it was great. One of the times we went to one of the biggest ones we'd ever been to at that time, and they were starting to get nervous, and I was really serious. I wanted them to be serious. They were getting really nervous because we heard the band over next to us warming up, and oh my God, they were good, and we're going to go on after that. Are you kidding me? We're going to follow that thing and you know, and I, I pulled them all in and I think they thought I was gonna yell because they were a little unfocused or paying attention. I think they thought they were gonna get like one of the McCullough-ism speeches. And instead I said, all right, so be a, a duck walks into a bar and I told him a joke. Because that's what they needed right there. They needed to get pulled back to reality. And they all looked at me like I was nuts. And it was a great joke, by the way. And I told them a joke, and they all laughed, and they all went out to their warm-up circles, and they all snapped in, and we, we won the stupid contest. It was great. So there's a time and a place for everything. But I think what keeps me focused is, is most of the time, it's, it's time to get serious, because that's what serves everybody the best. But there's times I'm really glad I have a sense of humor, because to be honest, that's what they need. They need that. They need me to be. There's times you got to kick somebody in the butt, there's times when we're allowed, we're not allowed now because we have to be six foot away. But in, in regular times, there's times you need to kick somebody in the rear and there's times they need a hug and you got to decide which time. And nobody needs the same thing all the time. Everybody needs both once in a while. Once in a while, I need kicked in the butt, okay? But I could use a hug and you're all like that. Okay, Julia, you got anything else? Yes. Um... How can you help your section be better if they don't really pay attention to what you say? <laughs> uh, 
Well, that's a good one, isn't it? Okay, so here's what I think. And, and then this is, you're gonna go, well, that doesn't answer my question, but I, I believe this, so I'm gonna tell you what I believe. You know, any of you that are on here that have actually been my students go, yeah, he kind of tells you what he thinks. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't sugarcoat stuff or he's never gonna tell you this if he really thinks that. So I'll tell you what I really think. Um, I think people will listen to you as soon as they know that what you're saying is valuable. And I, I don't mean to play tennis and just hit the ball back over on your side of the net, like, well, it's your fault. But I do want to, I want to, I want to tell you what I think. I think people will li listen to you. They think that what you are sharing changes their life in a positive way. But if they think you're just wasting their time, uh, good luck because they're thinking about everything except what you're saying. So, you know, just saying, well, the band director told us to come over here and we've got to run a sectional or the choir director said to go out in the hallway and woodshed this or the teacher wants us to go out here and like work on our part. And your only reason for being there is because you got sent there and they just put you in luck. That's going to be, that's going to be a terrible 15 minutes or a terrible two hours. It, what, the time doesn't even matter. <laughs> but if the last time you met, let's say you're a trumpet section leader, the last time you met with your trumpets, they all walked out going, I, I can play that rhythm now. I could never play that rhythm. I mean, she taught me that rhythm. It's, I, I can't believe I can play that rhythm. Guess what? That's how they walk into the next rehearsal. They're excited because the last time they were with you, you helped them. And the next time they want more help. So if you're, if you're not getting the result, Adults, don't turn it around like face the mirror towards them and go, you guys suck. You're not, uh, don't, don't, that's a cop out. If you're not helping them, they're going to come towards you. But if they find that your time is really helpful to them, I think, I think they will be much more willing to listen. That's a hard one. I know I want, you wanted a quicker, faster, easier answer, but I really think you, it's self-reflection. I think it's self-reflection. All right, Julia, you got anything um, else? Yeah, I, one more question, kind of, we got two questions that were kind of uh, similar. Right. Um, but basically the premise is when you have either a really large band or you have a large section um, with a lot of different personalities and a lot of different, uh, you know, ways that people think and feel, um, how do you ensure that you're reaching everybody and how do you ensure that you're, what do you do to make sure you can all achieve your goal? Yeah, that's that's harder. I used to, it's funny because I used to have a really small band and then I used to think, wow, I mean, it'd, it'd be so great to have a big band because you could do so much more stuff with the big band. And one day I kind of looked at it and go, oh my God, we're huge. And then I had the small band because it was so big, you know, how do you, we didn't have communication. Like I, you know, it would take me all year to learn everybody's name all of a sudden, where we used to all be able to fit in my van. I mean, it was so little, you know, it was like one little group. So, so it's, it's a real, that's a real question. I think what you have to do is it's going to, first of all, you're, it's going to take time to get to know everybody. So I, I, you know, how do you speed? I don't know that you can speed that up. I think for you to go, I got to know everybody personally, and I got to know like about their personal life and what they want to be someday and what their dog is. Okay, and I got 40 people in my section. You can't do that. So here's what I think you can do. I think you can get them go the other way. I think you can get them to all buy into your plan. So I think the thing that unites them is not their unique differences. I think, first of all, you use you use them towards you. So think more of it being a magnet to you instead of you thinking you've got to spread yourself so thin to go to all of them. I don't know if that makes sense to you. But you go, all right, so here's our culture. This is what makes us us. They're, get them involved in that. Then as time, so now we're on track. Okay, now we're kind of all on track and we're all going one way. Now, the minute we get that thing rolling, then it is your job to, to I mean, memory games, first of all, get to know everybody, you know, and know that these, this kid came from this school and that kid came from that school. Here at the University of Miami, we have the problem of they're all majoring in different stuff and they're all from 50 different states. And we've got a bunch of international students and we've got kids never, ever been in America or seen an American marching band ever. They join because they think it looks American. So I think I'll be in the band. 
oh my goodness. So the very first thing we do is we've got to kind of get them to be us. And then the fun part is then getting to learn who they are and their, you know, where they came from and, and the international kids, like their cultures and their, you know, that comes second. So first you just make everything so warm and welcoming, you kind of pull them towards you, I think, and get us on, get us on one train track. And then you'll have time as you develop, you know, and, and don't, don't hang out with your cliques. Okay, get a, you get a lunch break, a dinner break, you get a trip, you get a bus seat, you get, don't sit with the same, don't sit with the kid you've known since second grade all the time. Go, hey, you know, hey, we're going to the game, can I, can you and I want to sit together? It'll give us a half hour to just chat, want to do that? There you go, you see, use that time. Water breaks, don't go, go, don't go sit with the kids you've known forever, go sit with that little clique that's from your section, and no one, no upperclassmen are sitting over there with them. Go talk to them. Okay, you can spend tonight on some chat thing that you're gonna do anyhow. That little kid that no one's sitting next to him or to her, uh, junior or the senior goes over and sits down to them and talks to them during their break. And I know we're gonna have the six foot distancing and oh my God, it's gonna be crazy. But talk to them and they get in the car tonight after orchestra practice or after band practice or whatever. And their mom goes, how'd it go? Oh my God, this senior came over. His name was George. He talked to me for like five minutes. Oh my God, mom, he's like the greatest kid. You know, they live like two over. You just made that kid's day. That kid probably now band or orchestra or whatever they're in for the next four years because you took time at a water break. We, us, right? We, us. Because you could have gone over and talked to your buddies like you always do. <clears throat> or you can make that kid's day. Okay, that's a no-brainer, right? I mean, how, 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 how to spend that water break? That's a no-brainer. All right, Julia, you got anything else? Yes, this is our last question. Um, what do you, right. do you do when someone or people in your group hates that you're playing? Okay, that's a tricky one. Um, it's funny because I think usually when people hate music, that very often comes comes out like, <laughs> like you'll sight read something and this could be you could sight read you know band orchestra you could sight sing it in choir and they go oh I don't like that well nobody liked that rendition of it because that was like the worst rendition of I mean I don't even know what the song I you know sometimes I've even written the music and or arranged the music or something and they play it and I can't even recognize it because it would you know we butchered it we're sight reading and then right away kids are real snobby about it and go oh I I don't like that. No, nope, this isn't going to work. And I, I think we got to be really careful. To, isn't that a, that's a society thing. You know, the society thing. We're way too quick to judge, aren't we? Ooh, I don't like that. Kids do that with food. Oh I, oh, I hate that food. Oh, when did you eat it? Oh, I've never tasted it. Well, then how would you, you know, how would you even know? So Music is, you know, and again, are you allowed to have things you like? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, kids with kids in my high school bands for years, you know, they sometimes they bring me something. They go, oh, Mr. McCullough, you got to hear this. You, uh, I didn't love it. I'm, I didn't love it. Now, I was glad I heard it because it was something I didn't really know before. They would, they would turn me on to something I'd never heard. I didn't have to love it. But I also would take time to listen to it and, and sometimes even listen, okay, well maybe I don't get it. And then I'd listen to it again. But then, you know what I would almost always do? They'd bring in some, you know, back then it would be a CD or before that was a cassette or, you know, I don't know, eight track tape. I don't know. I've been teaching for a while. So they'd bring me this crazy version of something they wanted me to hear. And I'd say, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to check this out tonight. I'll play it in the car. I'll play it when I get home. Here, have you ever heard, and I'd grab off the shelf something that I knew, you know, they hadn't heard. Oh, have you heard this jazz thing? Have you heard this pop thing? Have you heard, you know, whatever it might be? Have you heard this, re I've got the, the Marine band playing, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And I'd trade them. I'd say, you listen to that tonight. See, let me know what you think, and I'll, I'll listen to your thing. And then very often it was really funny because sometimes I'd love their stuff and I'd go, okay, so I, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I, you know, I kind of downloaded that. I wanted to hear it again. They go, oh yeah, that's cool. And they go, that's funny because I kind of downloaded yours too. It's really good. You know, I'd never heard of them and it's, you know, I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know Dave Weckl was that good of a drummer. Or I didn't know, you know, like, I, so it was, it worked both ways. So if people start to say they don't like something, um, 
tell them to give it a shot. And we are artists. We are artists. We are, we are not going to, nor are we supposed to like every single thing the same. Because that would be, that'd be insane. We're supposed to have favorites. We're, we're going to have favorites. It's okay. I've played a million pieces of music, which were not my favorite pieces of music. I put myself through college playing drum set, mostly country Western music. And I don't like country Western music. But where I went to school, I could get paid on weekends to play country Western music. So guess what I played for the money, you know? And then every once in a while, I'd go, God, was that shuffle beat thing in that country Western, and that works great in a jazz band. So I would steal it, you know? But you know, who am I to be, you know, such a snob that I don't, but I would play for people who loved it. They loved it. I loved the money. That's a win-win, you know, and it also made me really learn early on, like, okay, not everybody likes the same thing. We're not supposed to, but doesn't mean we don't try really hard, because I was, I was kicking it, trying to be the greatest, you know, country western drummer of all time. I didn't even like what I was playing. Didn't, doesn't mean I wasn't really trying one, just means, you know, that's not my, that's not my favorite kind of stuff. That's not what I love. Okay, Julia, you got anything else? No, that's it. Um, I put uh, his email address again in the chat. So if you sure. have another question at a time, <laughs> you can email him or if you want him to send you any of his handouts or materials regarding leadership and marching movement. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, um, I'd love to do that. I've got a bunch of things I could send you. I could certainly send you some notes from today. Uh, we didn't get to cover everything because I kept watching the time a little bit. Um, I do want to tell you one last thing, Julie, if we got 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, this will be, if we ever needed student leaders, and I am I'm such a proponent of student leadership. I mean, all of the bands I ever had, I would have I would have no I would have had no success whatsoever if it wasn't for the student leaders that I had. I, I, I just I, I owe them everything. So anything you know when we had band rooms full of trophies or we had the band being noticed and invited to things or I had the University of Miami calling asking if I wanted to come down here and teach, none of that would have ever happened if it hadn't been student leaders in our organization because they built those bands. I might have guided them, but they they had to put in work to do it. So I, I think this is so important. That being said, this year, this coming school year, student leaders ever in the history of music groups have been as important as you're going to be this year of all the unknowns. Your band directors, your choir directors, your math teachers, your orchestra directors, everyone is going to be one inch ahead of the next hurdle, the next, the next hoop to jump through. And we're, I don't, know, I don't know if I should say we're scared, but we certainly are anxious about how to do this for all of you. We are going to need our student leaders strongly in support by our side all the way through. And it's gonna change, I'm afraid, folks, every day, if not every hour. So what you're all attempting to even take a summer morning, it could have all been at the pool or something, you know, and you decided to, you, to sit here and listen to me ramble on about student leadership, there's something great about that. And yet I will tell you, you're more important to us as a society this year than before. So I, I wish you all all the very best. Thanks for tuning in today. And, and Melissa, thank you for even running this great thing this summer. And Julia, I love you. And thank you for all, all your help. And uh, everybody, I wish you the very best of luck. Stay safe, use hand sanitizer, and wear the mask. You look great, doesn't hurt anybody, and it helps everybody. So wear the mask. Okay, bye guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.